your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn there with me to 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. We're going to look at that in just a moment. So if you go to the Old Testament, go to the uh, book of Genesis, and then kind of go right up a few books, you'll find the book of Genesis. We've been talking about the subject of, of what? Worry. Worry, yes. Um, and we've been talking about that for about two or three weeks. And what we said is this, is that basically... Worry is this thing is, and the reason why we worry is because we're trying to control the future. We feel good about today, but tomorrow we're just unsure of. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's fear in it. So somehow if we worry about it, um, somehow we can get some control in it. And what we did is we looked at the first two weeks. We looked at what Jesus had to say, in, especially in Matthew chapter 6. I would encourage you to read it. I encourage you to go to our Facebook page. Uh, listen to the sermons that we talked about those two weeks. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus' words, not my words. And Jesus said this. Do not what? Do not worry. I would not say that, but he says that. Trust God for tomorrow. Do everything you can today, but trust God for tomorrow. Do everything you can today. Now, for some people, they think, well, that means just be irresponsible. You know, I don't study, I don't fill out the applications, just, you know, it's kind of case rock. And Jesus said, no, 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 I'm not talking about irresponsibility at all. In fact, he never teaches that. Instead, he says, do what you can today, except trust God for tomorrow. And then we learned last week, specifically Jesus talking about this idea of this, what we worry about is what we are devoted to. If you want to figure out what you're devoted to, it's simple. It's what you worry about. I just said a couple weeks ago, remember, I said, I never worry about how well your kids do in school. I don't worry about that. Again, if you came to me, said your child is having difficulties, struggling, I would pray for them. But I've never been devoted to how well your kids do in school. And you're not devoted to my kids or my grandkids. Because, listen, what you're devoted to is what you worry about. And Jesus said, do not worry do what you can today, but trust God for tomorrow. Now, for some of us, we think that's, that's just too simplistic, that's too passive. I, I need to worry about it because um, I just feel like I'm not being responsible if I don't worry. I, I, have, to, I have to worry about it. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to wrap this up. And we're going to look at somebody who had all kinds of things to worry about. And what we're going to discover is is through that worry that led them to a place that God never intended for them to be. And what you will discover is God is going to ask them a question. And I think it's a great question for you and I to ask ourselves when we begin to worry. A question we need to ask is because it can be so revealing about where our worry is taking us and maybe what it's doing to us in our lives. 1 Kings chapter 19 is what we're going to look at, but to kind of set that up, let me kind of tell you the backstory before we get into the passage. The backstory is this. The nation of Israel began, and after a while became a kingdom, and after a while they looked around, and everybody else had a king. They looked around, and he has a king, they have a king, they have a king, and we want a king. We want a king. And the prophet that God was sent at that time said, hey, you don't want a king? You don't realize, you know, if you get a king, you know what kings do? They raise taxes. You know what kings do? They gather armies and they try to come. You don't want a king. And the people said, we want a king. And God said, you want a king? Give you a king. And so they begin to have kings. And the first king was King Saul. Then there was King David. And then there was King Solomon. After a while, then the kingdom split. And there was the northern kingdom and there was the... Southern Kingdom, because they were in the south. You're such a smart group. See, another Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, and the Northern Kingdom was also known as Israel, and the Southern Kingdom was also known as Judah. The Northern Kingdom comes along, the context we'll look at this morning is they had a king by the name of Ahab, and Ahab was a very, very wicked king. In fact, he led people not to God, but away from God. He led them to idol worship. So God comes along and he has this prophet, Elijah. And this prophet, Elijah, does what God does many times. Many times in our life, we start to stray from God. And God sends somebody along, you know, maybe a parent, maybe a friend or whatever, and they speak into our lives. And we do often what Ahab does is we're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And we 
kind of ignore that. And this prophet comes along and he says to Ahab, God is tired of you leading people away from him and leading people into false worship. Therefore, God is going to turn the rain off and he's going to bring havoc into the economy of this nation. And Elijah leaves. And Ahab goes, yeah, 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 I'm sure that, yeah, 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 I'm not going to bother with that. A month goes by, no rain. Two months go by, no rain. Three months go by, guess what? No rain. And God says to Elijah, I think you better leave that area because Elijah goes, why? God says, because you turn it off and people think you can turn it on. And so they're starting to look for you. And so he goes away for three years and God takes care of him. He provides for him. He's faithful to him. And after three years, the economy is in, in horrible shape. There's been no rain. And God says to Elijah, I think I want you to go back and speak to Ahab. Because I think I'm ready to turn the rain back on. So Elijah goes back and he comes to Ahab and he says, God has decided that he is going to turn the rain back on. He's going to make it rain again. And Ahab said, that's a good thing. And Elijah says, now before we do that, though, we're going to have a meeting. Kind of a prayer meeting. And what I want you to do is, Ahab, I want you to get the 400 prophets of Baal, this God that you worship, the prophets that worship him, that you have led the people into. You get all those people. We're going to go to this place called Mount Carmel, and we're going to have a prayer meeting. Some of you probably heard this story. It's a cool story. And so he says, that's where we're going to go. And what we're going to do is we're going to go up there. And the prophets of Baal is they're going to ask the Baal, the God, for it to reign. And then I'm going to ask Jehovah, God, the God of your fathers, to reign. And then we're going to see who's really God. And we're going to see if it really reigns or not. And so that's exactly what happens. Is They all go out to Mount Carmel. Here are the 400 prophets of Baal. Here is Ahab, here is Elijah, they're all gathered around. And not only that, there are thousands of other people that come around from this nation. And they're all viewing this. So when they get out there, here's what takes place is, is that they get up there and Elijah goes, Okay, prophets of Baal, you take this altar over here. And you go ahead and take that altar and you do whatever you do. And you start praying to your God. And I'm going to take this altar over here. This altar over here that used to be an altar that was for Jehovah God. It has been left for shambles, and I'm going to rebuild that, and then I'm going to use that in order my prayer for God. So that's exactly what happens. Uh, the prophets of Baal begin, and they get this altar going, and they start, you know, burning wood, and they start doing all these things. And so what they do is with that, and they start calling out to Baal, and they start sacrificing animals, and they start crying out, and they start dancing, and it goes on from breakfast to noon. And then Elijah does something that uh, in our day is very politically incorrect to do. He makes fun of their God. He pokes fun of them. And he says to the prophets of Baal, uh, maybe you need to shout a little bit louder. You know, maybe your God's hard of hearing. Is, is your God really a God at all? Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's, you know, maybe he's out to lunch. Maybe, you know, maybe, you know, whatever it is, he, somehow he can't hear you. And that causes them to even get a little more frenzy. The prophets of Baal begin to cut themselves and begin to chant even more. They begin to dance even more and scream even more. And that goes on until the early evening time. And finally, Elijah says, all right, kind of like get off the stage, you know, enough of this nonsense. It's my turn. So he says, okay, now we're going to see what my God, the God Jehovah, can do. But before I pray, before I ask God to do something, on my altar, what I want is I want water to be dumped on it. Now, remember it had rain for three years, and I don't know where he got the water, but they dump water, and they just soak it. Not just soak the wood, and not just soak. I mean, the ground is completely soaked around it. And then Elijah gets out there and he asks and he prays to God, Jehovah, and God just lights up this altar and just consumes it completely. And the people look around and they go, huh, I think God, Jehovah, is the real God. <laughs> and Baal really isn't the true God. 
And they turn and they kill and they slaughter all 400 prophets of Baal. And Elijah goes to Ahab and says, I, you better get headed back to the city because it's going to rain. When it starts raining, you better be back there. And so he heads back. Elijah takes his partner to go up the mountains. He says, you can, can you see it raining yet? Not yet. But then it starts to rain and it begins to pour and pour and pour. And at this moment, can you imagine? Because you remember it hasn't rained for three years. The economy's in completely wrecked. People are looking for somebody. And Elijah has, in a sense, made a rain. He is a rock star at this moment. I mean, he's, I mean, think of anybody in our society today, sports, music, movies, whatever, you think about, I mean, if this, you know, wherever this person would go, people would just be in awe. That's the way it was for Elijah. He is just a hero, a national hero. And you think, there's no way he would be afraid of anybody, right? But Ahab goes home. And when he gets home, Ahab has a wife. Anybody know what his wife's name was? Jezebel was her name. Now, I don't know if anybody's here named Mother Jezebel, and I'm not, you know, I'm not against that name or anything, but there's still, even today, I mean, even when people hear the name Jezebel, there's, a, there's just not a good feeling for a lot of people for that. And, but this Jezebel was evil to the 10th degree, okay? She was evil, evil, evil. And Ahab goes back and tells all the story about what all that happened and what Elijah had done, how the prophets of Baal had been killed, and that's where we pick up the story. Chapter 19, uh, beginning in verse 1, it says this. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. She says, basically, here's the deal, Elijah. By tomorrow, just like the prophets of Baal lost their life, you are going to lose your life. Now, here's the thing. I don't know about you, but here's the thing. From our perspective, in other words, when we, we just, I get into it, right? You know, we see the entire story and we look at it and we say, gosh, look at all God had just done right in front of Elijah, right? All the power he displayed is. In that moment, if I was sitting next to Elijah and he, I heard that, you know what I would have said to Elijah? Tell her, woman, bring it on. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Come on. I mean, you, I, I realize you are married to the king, but really? How can I be afraid of you? Here's the Bible, though. This is what I love about the Bible, too. This is why I tell you to read the Bible. Why the Bible is true is because, let me tell you what, you don't include these things if they're not true. This is not made, this is Elijah is supposed to be one of the heroes of the faith. He's supposed to be a great man of faith. And this great thing just happened. Here's what happened in verse 3. It says this. Elijah was afraid and what? And ran for his life. He was afraid. Elijah was like, I'm okay today, but I'm not sure about tomorrow. This is okay today, but I'm just not sure about tomorrow. That's us, isn't it? We can, many of us have even seen God be faithful in the past, and yet something comes along, and yet we're, we're just not sure. We're fearful because tomorrow is what? It's uncertain. And that brings fear. That was Elijah, and he began to run. The Bible goes on. When he came to Beersheba and Judah. Now Judah is in the southern kingdom. He's not just run a mile away. I mean, he has run into a different country. He's so scared. And he's so frightened about the uncertainty of tomorrow. He left his servant there. He went himself on a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree and sat under and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I know better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and he fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He is almost, we're going to see. He's just hyper-focused on the uncertainty of tomorrow. And God had just demonstrated his faithfulness to him. He looked up. And there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he laid down. And then the angel of the Lord came back to him a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat. 
For the journey is too much. So he got up, he ate, he drank, and he strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days, 40 nights, until he reached Horeb, the Mount of God. Now, Horeb is this. It also refers to Mount Sinai. This is where, uh, if you remember, if you got a Bible, it's uh, Moses, the burning bush. This is the place where God gave the Ten Commandments. This is the place where Jewish people thought this is where God hangs out. And he goes 500 miles, basically. And he travels to all this place because he's so <coughs> frightened by the uncertainty of tomorrow. There he is, and then God asks him a question. Verse 9, it says this. He went into a cave, and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, what? What are you doing here, Elijah? What? What are you doing here? I, I, I mean, I realize there's a lot of uncertainty about tomorrow. There's fear of what's going to happen. But what are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're so far from the place that I had you. What are you doing here? And I think that's a good, good question for us to ask. Because here's what worry can do for you and I. Sometimes it causes us to run. In fact, we have run sometimes because of the worry in our life. Physically, emotionally, mentally. Sometimes we we'll, we'll run from a relationship. We detach ourselves from people because of worry. Sometimes we detach ourselves emotionally. Sometimes we, we find ourselves running sometimes. You know, we used to have one glass of wine, and now it's two, now it's three. And we find ourselves in a place physically, emotionally, mentally, that we weren't before. Because we've allowed worry to take us there. The question I think that God could be in that moment and speak to us verbally would say, what, what are you doing here? Why are you, why, why, why are you here? And Elijah answers uh, in the way that most people in Scripture we see answer. <coughs> most of us would answer. And would say, God, you, you don't understand the sad story. <laughs> you don't understand. Here, here's the reason. So he says down in verse 10, Lord, um, I've been very zealous for the Lord God. And the Israelites have rejected your covenant. They broke down your altars. They put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. What am I doing here, God? Do you not understand what's going on? Do you not see what's going on? What am I doing here? God, I, I, listen to my sad story, God. God answers. Verse 11 says this. Then the Lord said, go. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. And Elijah might have said, what's that going to do? Do you not understand, God? Jezebel's after me. I'm the one that's standing up. Ba da 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 da. God says, no, just go, just go, 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 go. Just go and stand at the front of the cave. And the Bible goes on. It says this. And then a great, powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out, and he stood at the mouth of the cave. And then the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? I could understand why you're here. If I wasn't in the mix, <laughs> I could understand why you were here. I could understand your fear of the uncertainty of tomorrow if you didn't know I was Jehovah, God, and my faithfulness in the past, in the present. I can fully understand. But what you're doing is you are looking it through the lens of circumstance. But we all have a tendency to do when it comes to those things in our life. Look at it through the lens of faith in me. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing? Then it goes on. Verse 14. He replied, 
I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've broken down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aaron. Now, what that means to us is, is this is Aaron already had a king. This isn't even in the, the, the nation of Israel, the nation of, of Judah. And God says, when you go, and you go this way, when you get there, you're going to anoint this king, and that's what's going to happen, and people are going to recognize that. You go do that, then he says this. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram, anoint Jehu, son of Mitchu, king of Israel. Now, Israel had a king. He was Ahab. Had a wife named Jezebel. He said, you, you go and take care of that. And then he says this. And then you also anoint Elisha, who's going to be a new prophet. And I think almost at that point is the light went on for Elijah. It's like, oh. So you thought this through, God. <laughs> the uncertainty of tomorrow, you already had it figured out. You, you, you already had a plan. You already provided hope. You... you you, 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 you've already got this in, in, in place, haven't you, God? Yes. That's why I keep saying to you, Elijah, what are you doing here? Because you have forgot to factor me into the equation of the uncertainty of tomorrow. Finish up verse 17 and 18. This is not the end of the story. You can go home and read the rest of it. It says, Jehu will put to death and you escape the sword of Hazel, and Elijah will put to death, and you escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 of Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. In other words, <coughs> Elijah, you're not the only one. You're not the only one. And that's why I keep saying to you, again, what are you doing here? The tendency for all of us is just like Elijah. And that is the fact is we get hyper-focused in on the uncertainty of tomorrow. And we're like, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And what happens is, is that worry has a tendency to drive us places that God never intended for us to be. And so I would ask you this this morning. If you have found yourself maybe in a place today that God had never intended you, the question that God would say to you, what are you, what are you doing? Here? What are you doing? What are you doing? Isn't it amazing? It's amazing how the faithfulness of God can be almost taken away in a moment of worry. <laughs> That's why I love the story of Elijah because I, I can relate to it so well. God can be faithful, 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 and even in a very dramatic way like was in Elijah's moment, right? And yet, just almost directly after that, he has this crisis in his life, a big uncertainty. And at that moment, his tendency is to what? Be like you and be like me. Be hyper-focused. What if, what if, what if? And what he forgot is, is what Jesus is trying to teach us and what Elijah had to learn the hard way is, do what you can today. And then you trust God with tomorrow. Because he's the only one that can do anything about tomorrow. When you find yourself in a place where you want to worry. And you find yourself in that situation. is to ask yourself this question. What am I doing here? Because as Jesus would say to us, is do what you can today. And then the uncertainty of tomorrow, which has always been uncertain, it will always be uncertain no matter what you do about it, how you worry about it is. The only way you deal with that in a way that gives you peace is you trust it to God who can do anything about it. Do what you can today. To trust God for tomorrow. So let me ask you. What do you think about the worry in your life today? Has it taken you to a place that God never intended you to be? 
mentally, physically, emotionally, whatever it may be? And would you be willing to, you know, kind of sit with God and be able to say to God, God, what I want to do is be able to say, I'm just going to trust you for, I'm going to trust you for tomorrow. I'm going to do everything I can today. But tomorrow, I'm going to trust you for that. That God, what I've done is, is I've looked at you the lens of circumstance. And the circumstances to me don't look good. They're uncertain. I'm unsure. I'm fearful about my marriage, about my job about my kids, about whatever it may be. I'm fearful of what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. And I recognize I've looked it through the lens of circumstances. But what I want to do is I want to look it through the lens of faith and the lens of trust. And I want to do what Jesus asked me to do. And I want to do is to say I'm going to do everything I can today but that I'm going to trust you for Tomorrow. That's where peace comes from. The peace that passes all understanding. The peace that Jesus is trying to talk to us about and gets us to the point in our life. Let's bow together and let's pray. <coughs>